Okay. Let's see. Okay. So let's see. This is respiratory system, and smoking is probably not a good thing. Don't end up like this. So I think I've got this on screen share. Yeah. So functions of the respiratory system. Um, Ventilation, the air is warmed, humidified, and filtered. You got gas exchange, uh, O2 and CO2. That's actual gas that's going across your uh, epithelium inside of your uh, lungs to your capillaries and then and then back from your capillaries or blood to your uh, alveoli. Vocal communication, obviously, you got a lot of, you know, got a lot of uh, immune components inside the respiratory system because you're breathing in a lot of dust and pollen and germs and whatnot. Uh, don't forget pH regulation of blood. So um, that's one of the um, one of the things. So if you hold your breath, your pH is going to go down because your blood is getting more acidic. Whereas if you hyperventilate a true hyperventilation, then your pH is going to go up. You're going to get alkalosis as you blow off uh, all of your CO2. Okay. So uh, your lungs or your respiratory system is one of the quickest ways quickest ways to uh, you know control the pH of your blood. Uh, and it, remember, it has to stay in that 7.35 to 7.45 range. Your blood does, so it's very important. So here's just the pieces and parts. So you got external nares, got nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and then you go down the larynx, the trachea, primary bronchi, and then those diverge into secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and it gets smaller and smaller from there. We'll talk about that. The conduction zone is simply where air is moving. Um, and so um, ventilation, so it's basically where ventilation um, is occurring, but no gas exchange is happening. Whether in the respiratory zone, actual gas exchange is occurring. And we'll go a little bit more into this later exactly. Where does the conduction zone end and where does the respiratory zone end? The respiratory epithelium epithelium uh, lines the majority of the respiratory tract and a lot of it's PSCC. Um, and, you know, remember pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Lamina propria is just the connective tissue right under that uh, epithelium. Um, so the epithelium plus the lamina propria, you call that the mucous membrane. So that's the lamina propria, that's the PSCC. And then you have this mucus layer and the mucus is made by these goblet cells. They call them goblet because it looks like a wine goblet. See, see the little stem in the wine goblet. But in real life, they kind of, to me, they look more like little pearl onions on your slide because uh, a lot of times you don't catch this stem, okay, on a cut. Uh, so the nose is the primary airway for respiration. It moistens and warms the air, filters the air. You got mucus. There's also hairs right at the beginning of the of the uh, of the uh, external nares. Resonating chamber for speech. Uh, houses the olfactory receptors. Don't smoke cigarettes through your nose. I don't know why we put this on there. I guess we were thinking, well, you do have more filtering capacity with the hair right at the openings and then the mucus, but no, you can get nasopharyngeal carcinoma too. That's bad. You don't want that. Um, external areas are the opening, right? The nasal cavity, you're going to have these superior middle and inferior meati. I'm probably not going to get that picky. Meati or meatus singular are just the grooves in between your conchal bones. Remember those turbinate bones on your, uh, on your, 
skeletal skeletal exam. Um, heart palate, don't worry about it. We did that on bones. Internal nares, don't really have a good place to point at it. Um, I'll show you where they're at on it. Here, see that dashed line? That's internal nares. If you could some get a scope and look in here, you would see like a little con a bit of a constriction right there. No way I can point at it. The most I can do is just put my bracket from here to here and go, what region is that? Nasopharynx. What region is this? Nasal cavity. What are these grooves? Meati. Um, this would be the oropharynx. So you got your tonsils in here. You got your lingual tonsils in your and your uh, palatine tonsils. Up here in your nasopharynx, you have the pharyngeal tonsil. And we'll get to those when we get to lymphatics. Um, and this would be laryngopharynx, and then you go into the larynx. And then this little guy is very important, and we'll get to him later. It's uh, the epiglottis. So that closes over and keeps food from going down basically your airway when you swallow food. So let's back up. You can see the little meati here. Okay. No sinuses on the test. We did that on the bone test. So no sinuses. Um, this is just everything we just said. The nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx. Mostly it's point and name. Although every now and then I'll go, true or false, you know, the pharyngeal tonsil is in the nasopharynx. True. The opening of the auditory tube or the eustachian tube is there too, by the way. Um, then you'd go palatine tonsil, lingual tonsils, technically oropharynx area. <laughs> um, lingual tonsils on the tongue here. Um, or at the base of it. Um, and then there's your ep epiglottis, right? And so mainly I would just put a bracket. What area is that? Laryngopharynx. What area is that? Oropharynx. What area is that? Nasopharynx. That kind of thing. Um, so the nasopharynx is simply an air passageway. It's closed off during swallowing. Uh, the pharyngeal tonsil, like I said, is up there. And then that eustachian tube opening is up there. The oropharynx, we talked about the tonsils. Um, that's stratified squamous, by the way, and the oropharynx because food passes there. Nasopharynx, food should not be passing there. So that's actually PSCC. Now you get down to the laryngopharynx, it's still a shared passageway for air and food. So that's, um, that's uh, stratified squamous, just like the oropharynx is stratified squamous. Um, you know, because it's for protection. This is what you look, that's the base of the tongue, that's the circumvallate papillae. There's your epiglottis, it's poking up at you, they're having a hard time drawing, but that's coming towards you on this drawing. There's your vocal cords, and I like the old names. You call these true vocal cords, and you call these false vocal cords. The new ones, it's fair game on your test. This would be vocal fold and vestibular fold. Glottis is just the opening, right? And then these uh, vocal cords are kind of like strings on a harp. You know, the longer they are, the thicker around they are, the the more towards the base range, where skinnier, uh, shorter, then the voice is more towards the soprano. And then some people just have really good control with this, and they can really stretch these out and put tension on them, and or let them relax and be loose, and so they have a broad range, you know, as far as singing. You know, bass to soprano. Um, Trachea has these tracheal wings around it. They're really more like horseshoes because the posterior um, is covered by muscle. You know, there's a muscle back there called the trachealis. And that posterior wall of the trachea, since it's up against the esophagus, basically, it can distort. You know, say you eat a big bite of cheeseburger or something, you don't chew it, and boom, you swallow it down. And that can cause a <laughs> a problem, you know, it takes its, it, it hurts, you know, on the way down, but thank goodness you have muscle there instead of cartilage because it can distort and facilitate that passage of the food down the esophagus, so it can kind of push on that 
Trinky House, you know, and work its way down. So the left and right primary bronchi, bronchi is plural, bronchi is singular. Um, we go like this. There's your right primary bronchus. There's your left primary bronchus. Uh, you notice this one's shorter, wider, and a little bit straighter. So generally, if so, a foreign object goes down the airway, it you know it shouldn't go down there. Um, it a lot of times ends up in the right lung. You know, I've heard 70% of the time it's just a straighter shot. Your heart's over here, so this is making more of a right angle, and it's skinnier. Um, so, and don't get me wrong, something could go in that left lung, but most of the time when they take an x-ray, it's in the right lung, apparently. Um, so the bronchi branch, and then they become secondary bronchi. You got three on the right, two on the left, and then those further branch again into the tertiary bronchi. Now, Bronchioles, they're like little bronchi, but they don't have cartilage around them. Notice the way you have cartilage around primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi. You do not have that, uh, that around bronchioles. There's smooth muscle around bronchioles. So you have terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles. Those, since they have smooth muscle around them, are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so they can either dilate or constrict. Um, I don't get too into the segments. You got maybe 10 segments on the right, eight or nine on the left. Um, here you can see primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, and then tertiary bronchi. And then you can see those are leading into these little bitty uh, bronchioles way out here. So that's just a better drawing, right? So, there goes your primary bronchus, and then there goes secondary, and there goes tertiary. Notice the way you have cartilage around all of them. Here's a little trick. If you have cartilage on the outside of this tree right here, and you look inside, it's going to be PSCC. So it's PSCC inside the trachea, PSCC inside the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary bronchi. But once you get down to the bronchioles, it's not PSCC anymore. It gets smaller. And it's just simple cuboidal. So you got simple cuboidal in the terminal bronchial and simple cuboidal in the respiratory bronchial. Now, when you get down into the alveolar area, it's all simple squamous. So once you get past that respiratory bronchial, it transitions into simple squamous because you want the skinniest thing you can for gas exchange. That's just showing you the segments. You just Photoshop that in. Uh, the only reason I'm showing it, say you might could get, you might could say you got lung cancer and it was just con confined to one segment. They might could just take a segment or a lobe out instead of removing the whole lung if they catch it early. Um, so the lungs are held within the pleural cavities. Remember, you have your visceral pleura on the lungs and the parietal pleura against the body wall, right? diaphragmatic surface is just towards the diaphragm, right? The costal surface is just against the ribs. And the mediastinal surface is on the inner surface, of, you know, towards the mediastinum, you know. So those are just surfaces. The right lung has three lobes. The left lung has two lobes, right? And these um, lobes are separated by fissures. A picture of that, yeah. So there's a superior lobe, middle lobe, inferior lobe. So notice you have three lobes over here. That's why you have three secondary bronchi over here. You only have two lobes over here, so you'll have two secondary bronchi over here. Oh, by the way, this little piece of cartilage is carina. C A. Uh, no, no, sorry. Yeah, C A R I N A. Carina. I pronounced it wrong for like 20 years because my instructor pronounced it wrong. Karina is what uh, they call it. And there we go. Oh, Karina's wearing a bikini because it looks like a little bikini. If it helps you remember, you remember it, that's fine, but it's pronounced Karina. C-A-R-I-N-A. The reason it's important is because that is it's a landmark. So when you take a chest x-ray, that's one of the first things you look for because it kind of orients you, you know, the bronchi are coming off of either side. 
and this is, that's not carina, that's just cartilage. Um, so this is your primary bronchus, there's your secondary bronchus, tertiary. Then you're going into the terminal bronchiole and respiratory bronchioles. So they kind of put a little divider here and it's so, or a little cut there. So it's showing you they just got smooth muscle around it. So by the way, back to that conduction zone, it ends at the terminal bronchiole. Where does the respiratory zone begin at the respiratory bronchiole? Okay, so that could be a good little true-false type questions. Then you go into what they call alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveolus, alveoli or alveolus singular. So all of that, al alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli, uh, it's all lined by simple squamous. True or false, alveoli have simple squamous. True. <laughs> so 150 million alveoli per lung. Right, so that's, uh, if you folded those out and put them on the floor, it would cover, you know, your lungs. Um, basically, it's, it would, the surface area would cover a volleyball court. So that's how much surface area you get by all those little alveoli being in there. Uh, you got a lot of elastic fibers. You got a lot of capillaries. Capillaries are wrapped around those alveoli so you can have gas exchange. Capillaries have simple squamous inside of them too, by the way. And the internal surfaces, you have a lot of macrophages and stuff in there to, you know, kind of help with your immune system. Because think of everything you're inhaling, dust and pollen and viruses and uh, bacteria, <laughs> right? So uh, you gotta have something to fight that. So alveolar type one cells, that's just your regular old simple squamous. And they provide the surface for gas exchange. And that's why they're, you want the thinnest thing you can get for good diffusion. Alveolar type two are very special cells. So they make surfactant. Think of surfactant almost like, a, almost like soap. So it reduces the surface tension. Remember, you're wet. The inside of the alveoli is damp. So you have hydrogen bonding from one water molecule to the next. Well, that's going to fight you as when you try to expand your lungs. The, the, uh, the surface tension inside of there or the hydrogen bonding is not going to want to let that happen because the water molecules are basically bonded to each other, you know, very weakly, but you know, it adds up. So if you have surfactant that breaks that up, it makes it a lot easier to inflate your lungs. <laughs> um, by the way, if you're born too early, like seven months instead of nine months, uh, you may not be making surfactant yet, and that's why the premature uh, infants have a hard time breathing. And, uh, you know, that was a, a big problem. Now they have an artificial surfactant that they can use, and that does help. Um, <clears throat> macrophages we talked about. Here's a capillary. Here's an alveoli. I know this is the way you get It's real thin. Simple squamous here. Simple squamous here. And here's a weird little situation. They're sharing a basement membrane. Because normally, this epithelium would have a basement membrane and this epithelium would have a basement membrane because all epithelia is connected to a basement membrane, right? But that would, having two basement membranes would be a problem because it would be too thick for this O2 and CO2 to get across readily. Um, so this is a weird little situation where two epithelia actually share a basement membrane. Good. True or false? Alveoli and capillaries share a basement membrane. True. Um, the diaphragm, this is relaxed. And everybody thinks the diaphragm just cuts straight across it, doesn't it? It's more of this S shape. Now then when, uh, this is, sorry, this is relaxed. I think that's what I said. Hopefully that's what I said. Now when you contract it, it goes this way. Okay, so that is going to increase the thoracic, you know, cavity area, decrease the pressure, and then the air is going to suck in, right? So that's your main muscle of respiration just for quiet breathing as a diaphragm. Yeah, maybe your external intercostals are helping uh, inhale a little bit. Your internals generally help you exhale a little bit, but, or they can. And, but this is mainly diaphragm for quiet breathing. 
True or false? What's the, not our, what's the, not true or false, but fill in the blank. What's the main muscle of quiet respiration? Diaphragm. Uh, but you can use other muscles if you're struggling to breathe, even your sternocleidomastoids, your scalenes, if you're really struggling. If you're blowing out forcefully, then you're using these down here, like your rectus abdominis and your obliques and your transversus abdominis. But that's, you know, that's more like forced respiration. Um, and that's what I just said. Um, or forced exhalation, I guess I should say. Um, I'm not going to ask you about mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors or CNS control of this. Um, bronchial asthma, sometimes that's to pollution or irritants, um, characterized by contraction or bronchial smooth muscles. So it makes those, makes them constrict. It makes it hard to breathe, right? And sometimes it's, you know, some people have different triggers like cold air, you know, or exercise induced asthma. Um, and so they'll get a secretion of mucus sometimes in there. So a lot of times these folks have to carry an inhaler and an inhaler is gonna have a bronchodilator in it. That's, you know, maybe similar to epinephrine that's gonna make you dilate your bronchioles. Sometimes they have a little steroid mixed in too to cut down on, you know, this inflammation. Um, Cystic fibrosis is a genetic inherited disease. It's actually an affects exocrine gland function. It's a chloride channel, don't stress on that. Um, but the respiratory system makes this thick uh, viscous mucus. And so that, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a problem because it makes it tough to breathe. And back in my day, these, the kids that had this, they didn't live very long, 10 or 12 years. Then they got better and better therapies and some medications and stuff to cut down on infections. Sorry. Cut down on infections. And then they got them to where we're living 20 years and then 30, even 40 is quite common now. So, but it's never gonna be fixed until they can get gene therapy to go in there and fix the mutation in, that, in those channels. Uh, don't smoke. So uh, this is smoker's lung, and you can see they also had some heart trouble too. Look how large that heart is compared to a normal. Um, yeah, so that's not good. I'm probably not going to do a tracing, but every now and then I can ask, what kind of epitheliums inside the nasal cavity or the nasopharynx? And you go PSCC. What's well, inside the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx? Uh, you go stratified squamous. Be careful with larynx. It's kind of got both. I should have probably put another one on here. I think above the vocal cords, at, at the vocal cords and above, it's stratified squamous. And when you get below it, it transitions into PSCC. Then you got trachea, primary, secondary, tertiary, bronchi. That's all PSCC. We talk about the bronchioles having cuboidal, and then the alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli all have simple squamous. If you want the skinniest thing you can get, the further down you get, so you can have good gas exchange. So, this is a world's worst trachea slide, but at least you can kind of see the curve. So, you know, that's your tracheal ring, that's your lumen, and you're zoomed way out. So, that's your, that's your PSCC there. And then here's your lamina propria. And there's some glands, by the way, but, you know, so if I had a much better slide than this and I put the pointer and go, what kind of tissue is that? Be specific, hyaline cartilage. What kind of tissue is against the lumen in this respiratory tract here? You go, pseudostratified ciliated columnar, <laughs> okay? Um, this is the larynx, you're looking at it from the front. That would be your Adam's apple right there. That's only half a point. Laryngeal prominence would be your whole point. I have assets, so I'd put a box around that. Um, so the cartilages, that would be your thyroid cartilage, that would be your cricoid cartilage, right? Uh, there's your cricothyroid ligament, by the way. They do make a little emergency thing that you put in your crash cards if somebody's choking. Um, you can punch a hole right here, basically, like an emergency airway. Um, you know, it's, it's called a cric tube, um, for short, anyway. Um, but it's only used in emergency situations. That's different than a trach. You, mean, you saw that lady on the first slide, you know. Um, so she that's more of a long-term thing. 
Um, you know, they can close them up, but you know, sometimes if somebody's in a coma or whatever, they might, they might put a hole here. This is the back, so your trachealis muscle would be here, right? Cricoid goes all the way around. That's your epiglottis right there. So you're looking post from the posterior. This A-shaped, that's so your retinoid cartilage, the retinoid cartilages. And right on the top, it's like a little piece of candy corn. It's like a little triangle looking area. And that's the uh, corniculate. So there's a corniculate cartilage. There's your retinoid. So that kind of looks like the letter A, which reminds me of a retinoid. And I looked that up and it actually means ladle. So like a, a ladle that you ladle soup out of a out of a pot with. And you can see it's kind of got that scoop it's a area. Um, so there's your epiglottis, there's your corniculate, there's your retinoid, there's your cricoid. Now I'm not gonna do the vocal ligament and vestibular ligament on this test since we don't have models, we just have pictures. Um, but I could do vocal cord true and false, right? Um, so there's your trachea, there's carina, there's bronchus, bronchus, there's your secondary bronchi, right? Okay. There's your larynx, so that's your thyroid cartilage and that's your cricoid cartilage. Okay. And here's your lobe, superior lobe, middle lobe, inferior lobe. So that would be a horizontal fissure and that would be an oblique fissure. So if I ask what groove is that, you would go oblique fissure. What groove is that? Oblique fissure. What lobe is that? Superior lobe, inferior lobe. What's this top point? Apex. What is this entire surface would be costal surface? What would this surface be? Mediastinal surface. What would this surface against a diaphragm be? Diaphragmatic surface, or you could say basal surface. I'd be fine with that. And there's your little cardiac notch. You kind of have another one over here. You can't see it. This is where the heart sits. It's an impression. Well, I guess you'd have an impression over here. I think they call this one a notch. Um, see the impression here. Well, I guess they call it impression on both. <laughs> Hylus, don't stress on that. It's a generic term. That's where all of this is going into or out of the lung, these veins and arteries and airways. But, you know, it's just generic for this area, you know, like a lymph node has a hilus, a kidney has a hilus. They, they use that word in a lot of places. So I think we're almost done. So there's the alveolar duct. The area in the middle would be the alveolar sac and the individual ones would be alveoli. So one disease we did not talk about that shows up sometimes is emphysema. So emphysema, basically these walls in between your alveoli will break down and it'll make that one great big alveolus. So you still can basically take in the same amount of air, but you don't have the gas exchange because you've lost a lot of your surface area. You know, don't forget capillaries are wrapped all around these guys. So you lose your surface area for gas exchange. Um, that's usually the smoking, but other things can do it too. You know, like I know a fellow and he, painted cars for a living and he ended up with emphysema because he never wore a, a you know the respirator his older fella still lived to be about 83 probably would have lived to be 100 without emphysema um but anyway um if you do a job like that make sure you wear your protective gear um one other disease we didn't really talk about was the respiratory distress syndrome so remember surfactant remember this is wet inside of here you have you have um, basically water molecules in here. So surfactant breaks up the attraction these water molecules have for each other, breaks up that hydrogen bonding, makes it a lot easier to inflate. But if you're born too early, you don't have alveolar type two cells. So it's um, much, much harder for them to breathe. So they used to call that fetal respiratory distress syndrome, but then somebody said, you know, they're not a fetus anymore, they're born. So they called it newborn respiratory distress syndrome. And then somebody says, well, you know, there is an adult form of this too. So now they just call it respiratory distress. So on the test, I would just go respiratory distress syndrome. You're not manufacturing what? And you go surfactant. What does surfactant do? You know, breaks up hydrogen bonding in, inside of the alveoli. Um, 
So that's four diseases we talked about, asthma, emphysema, respiratory distress syndrome, and cystic fibrosis. So I could do a matching on those or, you know, or just ask individual questions. Okay, so just make sure you can tell those apart or give me a little one definition of what they are. Okay, that should do it. That's in the meeting. And then I'll post this on, the, on our, where we post our videos. Okay.